What is up, guys? Teddy Cornwell here. Welcome to the Underdog Talk. And there's something about the Underdog. You already know that. But before we get into this podcast, I, I want to live out my lifelong childhood dream, Travis. And I want to give you an introduction. Is that okay, sir? Let's do it. And Bruce Buffer, if you are watching, take some bleeping notes because this is about to be the best intro on a podcast in history. I'm just going to say it how it is. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Actually, it's afternoon, but we're gonna we're gonna scratch that and say evening as well. Sanctioned by the Underdog Talk podcast. It's time. Yeah, you like that, Travis. <laughs> there you go. My, you know. Uh... Oh, oh, I was in. Oh, I wasn't done. Oh, we're getting into the juicy part now. All right, let's Out go. Of the, we're gonna say blue corner for you, sir. A mixed martial artist holding a professional record, 18 wins. I just gotta say, 14 by KO. 14 by KO. I'm like a loose record because 14 of those were by KO. I mean, he stands six feet seven inches tall, weighing in at hope this is still accurate. 244 pounds, fighting out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, presenting. The 2013 Breakout Fighter of the Year, Travis Hopperon. Now, now, before you even comment on that, equal, worse, or better than Bruce Buffer? Be honest. Don't you? you won't yeah, work. I won't hold back, but it needs a little bit of work. <laughs> but you're getting there. You know what I mean? Like, let, let me let, let let's start off with that. I remember the first time so vividly when Bruce introduced me. And it was like, you get the chills, you know, like you look back on, on your, on your career and you see, and, and you think back to just some of these freaking amazing times and certain points in your career that you will never forget. Um, the main, the, the, the first one, actually the second one, but the first one was at the Pearl at the Palms. That was my first fight and I was first fight of the night. And it really was walking into like a Coliseum there. You know what I mean? Nobody knew me. I was the first fight of the night. So we weren't supposed to be a big draw, all that kind of stuff. I fought James McSweeney, um, ended up knocking him out first round. Um, but walking in there, it was every, like if you were claustrophobic, it would have been a possible problem because you walk in there and the seats almost, they, they look like straight up, you know, cause it's like a built like Coliseum. But, um, the first time that I ever was, was just like mind blown was when I fought Chet Kong Congo at the O2 arena in London, um, which was my second fight. Yeah. Which was my second fight in the UFC and obviously he's a hometown hero right so they start announcing our fight and i remember the concrete under my under my feet just like vibrating and it would just and it just reverberated from my feet all the way up into my chest and i just remember being like oh my like having this chill come up your spine just be like this is just fucking amazing yeah. you know what i mean like oh man like not many people get to feel this or experience this. And that was uh, an amazing feeling. I was going to say, not many people. I mean, I, I don't I, I don't know what I would do if I was walking in front of, what, 50,000, 60,000 people to, I'm, I don't know what my, my, my walking song would be. Probably run this town just because, you know, I got to run this town. But And then Bruce <laughs> Buffer giving me an introduction. Travis, I, I don't know if I'd even remember that moment, to be honest with you. I, I'd be so starstruck and honestly you know you started your ufc career pretty damn good i mean you should have been 2-0 to start obviously you know that one got called a draw which was some bullshit uh if i'm allowed to say that um but you should have been 2-0 and and then right off right off the bat you're 3-0 in the ufc i mean what was that like jumping into the ufc from obviously bellator gladiator uh and going to the ufc uh what was that like and especially winning your first three or winning I would say winning your first three fights. Yeah. So it was, uh, I mean, it, at the time it was per, pretty surreal, yeah. right? Like, um, 
Let, let's let's kind of back up and I'll and I'll since this is the underdog talk podcast. Um let's start when when I started, right? I started fighting at the age of 26. I started training at the age of 26, 27. 26. Um yeah, what's that? I said 26. I, I yeah, we, we did our research. Yeah, 26. Yeah, so so you know starting late yeah you know what i mean and not n- not having nobody know who i am walking on into the ufc coming in like i think i was 10 and 0 at the time um you know coming in and and being like who's this guy is a big strong looking dude okay cool but then when i stepped in there it was like oh wow he's athletic you know and i think I remember back to the day, my first UFC fight that I really watched and as an adult, as a young adult, was um, Sylvia versus Rico Rodriguez. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, he's 6'8", I'm 6'7". He's 260-something. I was, I think at the time, I was 240-something, 250-something maybe. And I was like, I'm way more athletic than that guy. I said, I, I know, I, I know that I am. You know, and that was something that kind of helped push me into like even giving MMA a shot was the fact that I knew uh, how athletic I was. Nobody else did, you know, so starting training late, start fighting even later. Um, it's it's un, unheard of. It was unheard of at that time. Now you're getting guys doing some crossover because they know that there's um, there's a payoff or or there, there's a place for them in the UFC. It's pretty awesome to see that now. Um, but at that time, it was unheard of. And and I just, you know, had that trajectory of just moving up the ladder really quickly because I would, I would finish most most people. And, you know, what's interesting to me is underdog talk. I, I don't know if you know this. Obviously, Travis started late in the game and became a superstar. But he was also a baller as well. Um, why, why pick basketball as your first sport? Obviously basketball is dope, but you know, why basketball? Obviously you were really good. You actually went to community college to play ball. Um, and you were the 2000 coastal player of the year, I believe. Yeah, that was my senior year of, of high school. So my high school actually didn't have a football team. Um, and so really the only other sport I was familiar with was basketball and that was just my path you know that was the sport that i ended up loving um so i picked it up and i ran with it i played a year in call in 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 jc and then um you know you you look back and i and i don't have any regrets because it put me where i am today but um something that i drill into my kids now is to be a student you know, is to, is to be successful in school because that'll open up so many more doors. Like a part of me fighting was that I had no real other options to be a athlete, right? It was like, wh- what am I going to do at the age of 25, 26? Am I going to start football? Am I going to start basketball? And, and at that age, when I was in my early 20s, mid 20s, I actually told myself, you know, I think I could walk on and maybe play tight end for some team or something like that. Um, because I always believed in my athleticism and, and we come to see it in the UFC, right. And, and what I was able to do there, but, um, you know, that was, that, that was something I told myself. And obviously that kind of, you know, with training and such a skill set that football players have, I was, I was late to any athletics really. Um, but MMA, I just kind of gravitated towards it. It was first jujitsu for about a year, maybe a little bit longer. And then I had my first pro MMA fight down in Mexico. Um, and then it just kind of took over from there. And, and it's interesting. Everything happens kind of for a reason, obviously, you know, it, it was almost like a destiny to become a UFC star. Obviously, you know, if you didn't have basketball, who knows where you'd be and you might be a, a soccer star instead. And maybe your path wouldn't lead to UFC. Obviously I, I find that really interesting. And obviously it did work out for you. And you know, how hard it is, how hard is it, you know, obviously you started in Bellator and Gladiator, uh, just to name a few. How hard is it to get from those smaller divisions into the UFC? What's that process of getting called to the big leagues like? You know, it's uh, it's interesting. It wasn't 
it, it honestly wasn't something when I started fighting. I, I always just kind of knew that if I just did what I was supposed to do, that that would come. Um, I have the size, you know what I mean? And, and I had to prove that I could fight and I could win and win in impressive way. And so for me, it was like already a given in my mind, right? It wasn't something that I was hoping to get to. I knew I would be there if I just did my job. Um, but that in itself is its own mindset, right? You have to believe in yourself to be able to attain that. So, um, but I mean, getting the call and then actually going there and being a part of it was, um, I mean, I, I remember I, it, it was such a great feeling, but it was also like, yeah, I deserve to be here. Like I should be, this is where I'm supposed to be. I want to fight the best. Like, I don't know. I don't know if too many people know this, but in 2013, at the end of 2013, I was actually a free agent. I actually got a big, a big offer from Bellator. After I fought Josh Barnett, I was a free agent. I had fought out my contract. My stock was high. <clears throat> um, and uh, Bellator actually offered me a really good offer, but talking with Dana and Lorenzo and stuff like that, I was like, man, I, this is my home. You know what I mean? Like more, more than money, you know, the UFC and the UFC fans watched me grow from what I consider like a, a, a young man into a man, right? Like a boy into a man and see that transition. Um, and they were such a big part of it. And I believe that it was the competition that really drove that um, into me or, or got that out of me was, was me fighting in the best league in the world against the best competition. And so that's where I decided to stay at that time. Yeah. And, and, and it's like the NFL, obviously there's other perfect, like the UFL like arena football league. I mean, there's nothing like the big league, like the UFC, the MLB, the fan base, the, the players that are in there. And Travis, I, I got to talk about one fight that really, you know, brought your name to attention. Hopefully you can see me. Boom! You see that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, punch. yeah there you um, go. Your first big, well, against Devin Trube, you know, this is really where you kind of got your name out. You were, you were on a hot streak, obviously, coming from those uh, divisions into your UFC where you're winning, and then you do that Superman punch. Have yeah. you ever done a Superman punch in a fight before? Or was that just something that came and you connected? You know you know, and, and I had a smoker, which is like an amateur Muay Thai fight. And I did the same thing to the guy. It was like the first 10 seconds of the fight, hit him with the Superman punch and then a follow up head kick, left head kick. And that was one of my kind of go to moves. And um, when fighting Stefan Struve, I knew like there was a thing that he, he would always do whenever you would pressure him and then separate. And then if you started coming at him, he would throw a knee. Right. Because he's a taller guy and he can usually make up that ground. And so in my mind, I'm like, that's when I'm going to throw it. Right. And and so whether I land it or not, something else is coming, which was going to be my left high kick. You know what I mean? Because because that was just the combination that we worked on. And and um, and Eric Del Fierro down at Alliance, I was I was with them at that time. And that was one of his moves that he ingrained into me was was the Superman punch to the left high kick because it just flows so well the way the way you land, the way you take off on the Superman punch, and then the way you land to be able to throw that left high kick. So um, you know, it so it just worked. And and luckily it was there was that timing there and and it all worked out in my favor. And and it did, and you know. Don't beat me up, but that might not even been your most impressive fight because against Alistair Overeem, I, I was watching those highlights over and over, and you know one of those punches would send me into uh, into sleep, uh, into another dimension. Not only do you come back from that, you won with a leg kick, and that might be the most. I don't know if anyone, if you have you haven't watched that, go watch that. That might be the best fight in UFC history. I mean, what was going through your mind during that fight? And then after that KO of Alistair. Yeah. So that guy has like, he has such a great knee. 
and he finds the same spot on your midsection every single time. It wasn't like I could turn and he would hit this side and then turn and he would hit this side. He would put me in the same position every time and he would send that thing right up the middle and it would it would just hit me in my solar plex and and the first one was like all right that one did some damage but but I'll be good as long as you know just kind of and I'm trying to like get out like turn whenever you throw but he just had that way that that clinch work and he hit me there maybe three maybe four times uh, and and I was even when I would try to blade he would find that same spot so it wasn't like I was just sitting there square on to him it was like I was trying to turn to avoid him but he would round him out and come from the side and and just hit me right in that solar plex and I think by the fourth time he dropped me and I remember at that time just my my kids just popped into my head where it was like this isn't how you're gonna fucking lose this fight dude this is not how you're going to go down. And I remember him just unloading on me um, and, and trying to stop the fight. And he was kind of like, you know, hit me fast, not, not too hard, but like fast enough to where um, he was trying to finish it, get the ref to call it. And the ref at that moment was like, Travis, you got to give me something. Otherwise, you know what I mean? Otherwise it's done. That's what he was saying when he said that. And so when he said that, you'll see you go back to that fight and I'm and I'm on like my hands and knees or maybe just my knees kind of covering up like this. And I just pop up like like head up. But then I go right back down because, you know, I just wanted to show the ref that, hey, I'm still here. I'm, I'm weathering the storm. I'm, I can hear you. I'm coherent. Right. I know what's going on. I'm not finished. And so I did that. And eventually I was able to work up, get back to my feet. And I remember the minute that the fight kind of turned was when I got up from that and I kind of like circled to my right a little bit and he gave me just just enough um, room where I threw a hard uppercut and a left hook. And I and I saw him just like, oh, shit, he's still in this. Right. Like and I think he was gassed at that time because it took a lot out of him to hold me down, to try to punch and all keep me down, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and that's when in my mind, I was like, fuck the momentum switching right now. And I got, I got to stay on this. So we got into another clinch, pushed them off, hit them with a couple front kicks. It, it, I kind of felt like I was playing myself in a video game, like spamming, like spamming that front kick to like keep them off of me. Cause he was really good at pressure, but I had Pat Barry out for a long time before that. Um, when I was fighting at Jackson's and he has a lot similar style or, or he mimicked that dutch style of being more like covered up on the sides but being open in the middle right and so um and that was alistair style and so uh, pat and i really worked on hitting straight forward knees front kicks uppercuts all that kind of stuff and so as i'm spamming and then you'll see i throw a couple of side kicks because he started like closing like this throw a sidekick to get his hands back up to his to his temples and then i threw the the front kick and it landed right on his jaw you know but that whole you know what 10 15 20 seconds or something like that i mean when you're in the moment it just goes by so fast um but after that fight i was i was proud of myself you know what i mean i was like man i just overcame one of the nastiest um strikers in the game he's also a great ground like he's a submission artist as well um, i would say like maybe he's a little light on the wrestling but he has a pretty good game yeah. and um and i just I, I remember thinking myself like dude good job i was giving myself a pat on the back because that was he's a fighter through and through no matter what that man has knocked out some of the nastiest people in the world and that night I was not one of them. Um, and, and I actually returned the favor. So I was, I was very proud of myself at that moment. Damn. I, I hope you got yourself a nice cold beer that night and just had yeah. a, <laughs> enjoyed that because I, shit, I'd be running laps after that fight. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. that was, that was honestly, I guys, I don't know if you've seen that, you know, that link will be in the YouTube bio. Please check that out. Cause that is a gnarly fight. And obviously, against two very good fighters there's no question about that you know would, would you say that's one of your most memorable fights or if not which one was your most memorable fight in your career Travis? 
Yeah, I think I think what happened is after that fight, um, that's when I believe that fans felt like I arrived. Like I, I had felt like I was already somebody that you didn't want to mess with. But at that point, that's where I noticed, like, I went to a fight, I think, after that, um, you know, just sitting in the crowd and stuff like that. And it was cool getting pictures, getting people like, hey, great job, all that kind of stuff, right? Like, consistently. And then um, when I was leaving that fight, it was at, uh, it was at the, was it Mandalay Bay, maybe? It was the, not, not where I fought um, Alistair, but like the fight I went to go watch the fights. And I went to leave. Um, MGM. It was at MGM, but I went to leave MGM and I literally had people like, like my shirt was ripped and, and like, it was like, people were like mobbing me. And, and I actually ran into this restaurant, like tried to get away, went into this restaurant, like kind of laid down in a, in a, uh, in like a booth. That way I, I would like get a moment to breathe. But yeah, I, I had like, somebody grabbed the back of my shirt, like the collar and pulled it and like yanked me back. And I, and I turned around and I was like, what the, and it was like this lady, like this older lady, like maybe fifties or something like that. And I was like, Oh, like I, I can't yell at, you know what I mean? But it was like one of those things where I was like, Oh man. And so after that, I was like, well, uh, I was kind of flustered in the moment, but it was, when I left that situation, I thought about it. I was like, fuck, you know what? That's cool. Because in my mind, it wasn't about like me being, Oh, look how cool and famous I am. It was more about like, you know, what's awesome is, is taking a picture with somebody and them going back and, and being able to be like, Hey, you know who I met, you know, who I got a picture with it was Travis Hopper Brown. That's so cool. And kind of making their day or their trip or something like that. That's how I always looked at, those opportunities to take photos with, with fans or, or, you know, in those kind of situations was that I could maybe make somebody's day that was maybe having a hard time or something like that. And it gave them something to be stoked about, you know, to make them happy. And maybe their trip was worth it after that. I don't know. I don't want to, I'm not trying to say I think that highly of myself, but you know, when I'm, when I'm stoked on meeting a fellow athlete or something like that. That's always kind of what I envision I did for other people, you know, just kind of give them that kind of cool experience. Yeah. And I'm just glad you didn't KO that uh, old lady that I mean, a different story there, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's, you know, treat everyone equally. And at the end of the day, we're all human beings and you yeah. know, it changed a lot of people's lives in that one day. I know if I met you in person and, you know, you greeted me, I'd be going around the rest of the day saying, I, I met you. So I, I'm sure you did make a lot of difference in people's lives. And, and, and I really do like that. And, you know, what's interesting to me is we talked about how the UFC's kind of changed so much, obviously, since you started um, you know, to now. Um, do you see the UFC going in the right direction? I do have to ask. Yeah, I think um, I think it's uh, whether right or wrong, it's evolving um, and and at the end of the day, it's a business. And I think people need to, um, need to realize that need to think about that. Right. And, and that it's, it's like, it is what it is, you know, um, it's a sport. It's, it's, it's a business though, first of all, first and foremost. Right. And, and you make money off of people fighting. So, I think they're doing a great job. Obviously their, their sport has grown a hundred times since I started. And, um, and I, and I'm, I'm stoked that I got to be a part of that for, for a little while, you know, but, um, I mean, yeah, the direction the UFC is going, it's nothing but good. The fighters are getting paid more. Um, there's, there's more opportunity for the athletes um there, there's more fighters in the stable so that means that that more people are just making more money you know what i mean like when i started man i made six and six you know, six thousand to fight six thousand to win um guys now i've heard walking in making like 20 and 20 you know what i mean and that i like I, when i was i think it wasn't until 2012 
maybe I was actually fighting for like 20 and 20 when I was fighting like Gabriel Gonzaga, Alistair Overeem and Josh Barnett. I was right around that eight, that range. I think it, I was at like 24 and 24, you know, 26, it'd go up by two grand every time. And so, you know, people don't realize that at that time I'd already been in the, in the UFC for three years and I wasn't making that much. But once I fought out my contract, that's when things changed, right? So, so I was able to, you know, I, I doubled down on myself in that situation because they gave me an offer. I thought I was worth more. I held out um, and I bet on myself. And that's all you can do. I mean, as an athlete, you are your own employer. So you have to, you're like an entrepreneur. So you have to either bet on yourself or go to take the safe path or whatever. I could have taken a safe path and made. 30 and 30 after I fought Josh Barnett, which was, you know, I think, uh, actually, I think it was like 35 and 35 or something like that, which would have been 70 grand. I'm like, whoa, 70 grand, you know, at that time. Um, but I doubled down myself and it paid off. Yeah. You got to believe in yourself in life. Travis. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. And obviously there's a few big names who have made the UFC just so much bigger. I think, you know, one of them very well. Um, and I think, you know, Conor McGregor's coming back for UFC 303. Who do you have in that fight, him or Chandler? Man, you know, that's going to be – that's a – Conor's a tricky one, yeah. right, because because he's good. He's really good. And it depends on, I believe, on what Conor you get. Um, a driven, a motivated, a trained Conor McGregor is a scary individual. Um, I think Chandler is just hard nosed, a great workhorse, and he's a tough dude. And he's proven that time and time again. Um, you know, as far as that fight goes, uh, I don't know. I mean, that that's that's a tough one to call because it kind of depends on who shows up. Yeah. That's what Frankie Edgar was saying last week. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a fight. I think yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Nobody's quitting in that fight. You yeah. know what I mean? Like nobody's quitting in that fight. And and I think that it's you know, Connor has fought better wrestlers, as in Khabib and, and stuff like that, right? And then and then he's also fought better stand-up guys than Chandler, but I don't know if he's fought somebody like quite like Chandler that can put it all together and a motivated Chandler because Connor's kind of pissed them off. You know what I mean? Um, but that's, that's Connor's game. Like he does so well at that, the trash talking, that's another element that he brought that, that really not a lot of people were doing like Chael Sonnen would do that. Um, I don't really know too many other like great trash talkers. Um, but, Connor's been a great one. He's revolutionized the game. You, you see people now at pressers trying to talk shit and all that stuff, and they pale in comparison to Connor and Chael. Um, but it's it's a great it's a great tool when you use it right, and he knows how to use it. Yeah, and I was watching TikTok on my phone today, and I was watching the Jose Aldo uh, Connor McGregor uh, fight pre pre fight. Connor McGregor walks by him and takes a fart. Have you ever seen that? He farts on Jose Aldo. No. Oh, yeah. He worked a fork in Jose Aldo's face, and Aldo got so mad. I've never, I've never seen anything like that. But yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. that is, yeah, the trash talk is immense. I think it gets in their minds as well, and I yeah. think that's that's something special. And obviously, you know, to the next topic, I'm very late to the party, and uh, but congratulations are on or not on in order for you and Rhonda. Obviously, you know, you had a newborn a while ago, but mm -hmm. you no. Know, Congratulations on that. Um, you know, what's it like now being a father? Obviously, you already had kids. What's it like being a father now, you know, running a farm? What's life like after the UFC for you and Rhonda? Yeah, we we went from fighter to farmers, you know, and um, having a family now, having a young kid now. I, I mean, I've, I've had a family my entire career, but um, and my boys were a little bit younger. You know, um, I think I started fighting when they were like, maybe five, three and five or something like that. But um, having a toddler now is it, it's so much fun because I really get to enjoy every single 
phase that she goes through completely. Like I get to be present, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. And I get to enjoy these times again and know that these times won't last that long. You know what I mean? So when she's throwing a fit or when she's going through a hard time, it's easier for me to sit back and just kind of like be a lot more patient with her and, and, and just work with her a little bit more knowing that, you know, this, this isn't going to last forever. And I would much rather be here with her throwing a fit than have her not around. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so it's like, you know, all the, like the, all the messes that she creates, all the toys around, you know, flung around the house, the messes after the meals. It's like, man, I, th this is great. You know, this is, I love this. And then, you know, Rhonda and I got into the ranching and the farming and, and we're raising, um, pasture raised Wagyu now with uh, pasture raised poultry. And it's some of the cleanest, um, nutrient dense proteins that you can get. And that's, that in itself came from us being former athletes. You know, we wanted to know what we were putting in our body. Um, and so it, we started raising our own animals here in California, but then we decided to scale it. And so we, we brought on, we, had, we partnered with this gentleman up in, up in Oregon and um, who had a little more knowledge about cattle and about Wagyu and, and stuff like that. And then we really started learning about the regenerative style of ranching and what that can do and how that changes the meat, right? Like a lot of times when you go to the grocery store, it's just commodity beef and it's bullshit. You don't know what they're fed and whatever they're fed is, is going to end up feeding you. So like I, I was never a label reader, right? <clears throat> Until more recently when I started raising our beef and our chicken and knowing how clean it is, how much better for you it is than the commodity stuff. Um, and that was a huge driver for us. If you take care of the soil with regenerative ranching, regenerative farming, healthy soil means healthy grass, means healthy animal, which means, which leads to you because you ingest that animal. So it, it's a, it's a big circle. And then plus you get a, make something better than what it was before when you use these practices. Um, and, and that was the, a huge driver for us. And, and can the public buy your meats or is it just, Oh yeah. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. So we scaled it. So we, we just started selling publicly earlier this year. Um, again, we, we are Wagyu. So we don't raise just like ang black Angus beef or something like that. We raised the, the American Wagyu and the full blood Wagyu. So, you know, we invested in, in like the Japanese genetics. We have six full blood bulls, we have a, a herd of Angus mamas that we breed our full bloods to the Angus mama. And you have your F1 cross or your American Wagyu as, as we're also building up our full blood herd. So the quality, it's all about quality for us. It's not about quantity. Rhonda and I aren't doing this for the money, right? We're doing this because this is the right way to raise them and we want to take over more ranches and show them, but also us produce better grasses and, and have just have the environment in mind. And when you have that in mind, you also have the health of the people that are, that are, uh, buying and eating your protein. Yeah, no, I think it's, and I, from what I know about, you know, meat, Wagyu is one of the most pure expensive forms of, of beef. That's correct. Right, Travis? Yeah, I mean, when you get up to the some of the Japanese, the stuff that comes from Japan with with the full blood that comes from Japan, like Kobe beef or different stuff like that, that's actually a, a prefecture in Japan where they come out of, where they come out like they 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 breed them there, they raise them in, in Kobe, Japan, and then they're called Kobe beef. Um, but we have a hundred percent Japanese genetics that we are also breeding that came over in the '90s. So again with my with myself my wife's resources and the knowledge of our partner we're able to expand our herd and and really produce this amazing beef that it tastes amazing like when we took our first bite of the steer that we raised here we we're like what is this this is better than any beef that we've ever tasted before and we you know we we get kind of bougie sometimes we we'll go with ruth chris or whatever this that like really nice steakhouses and the stuff we were able 
to produce here in our backyard would blow that stuff out of the water because you have the taste tenderness and and huge huge flavor and then come the health benefits like the monounsaturated fatty acids the omega-3 to 6 ratios and that all is all determined by what you put into that animal and so that's also something that i think a lot of fighters uh, as they're fighting they don't think about what's going to come out after their career and i believe that a lot of athletes in general again not to hit it on the nose but um they're underdogs in yeah. life after being an athlete because they blow through their money they don't know what they're going to do so then they're stuck working a nine to five maybe at home depot or somewhere maybe you know whatever wherever they want to work but um it's important to get your finances right and to have a direction while you're fight while you're fighting while you're doing your athletic career in order to propel you and to give you that life that you want that you sacrifice for we we say all the time me and my wife like we have blood money you know what i mean we literally bled for our money and and so it's not easy for us to give it away you know what i mean so we use it in order so to set us up for the future so we can again live the life that we want pay attention be here for our kids not having to go to a nine to five and and all that kind of stuff so that's what we chose to do with our money so that we would need less um you know we have a source of protein i, I was just talking to you i was finishing up some some chicken right before we got on and it's our it's our pasture raised poultry that we raise on our ranch that uh, you know that i eat every single day or it's our wagyu for the for our beef and um you know, with that, it's it's been such a notice noticeable change in how I feel compared to the store bought stuff, and even going out. Like me and my wife, we'll stop somewhere quick, get something to eat on the way back, and every single time we're like, "Why did we do that? We should have just cooked something up at home because it's just not the same. You feel bloated, heavy, you just don't feel right." And then we eat our stuff, and it's like it's just fuel for our body and that's why i think some athletes are missing um and and also regular people as well like you know, uh, not the you know athletes or anything really that special we're just different mindsets but um it's like people that that aren't athletes they can feel the same exact way when they eat the clean protein that we also help produce there's other ranches out there that do that we're just one source for people to go and shop and i mean you've got it all on the ranch chicken beef i mean alligator i mean the list goes on and on i i thought i heard you say alligator i apologize yeah. about that now you know i love how you keep on bringing that underdog you know back into it because we all do start as underdogs and some people believe we're always underdogs um what was your biggest underdog moment in your career uh travis i think it was it was i think fighting in general mm -hmm. i don't think like i came from a basketball background i was working um different jobs when i decided to fight so people i don't think took me very seriously um so my whole entire career was an underdog moment and i and and i feel like if you look at yourself as the underdog you are constantly driven to to do better and i and i feel like that motivation turns into discipline and discipline is way more important than motivation so when you're sitting there and you feel like you've maybe made it or you're you're comfortable having that discipline to continue moving forward is something that mma really taught me um is that again discipline outweighs motivation 10 out of 10 times <clears throat> um, motivation comes and goes discipline you stay you stick with it and you continue moving forward yeah i think that's something that always stays with you and i totally agree and obviously while you were late to the fight game at 26 years young you had a very successful career and truly you know were one of the best in your era in the in the in the octagon you know what is your biggest tip for someone who's looking to get into combat sports mma like you once were there um shut up and work mm -hmm. learn be be receptive to coaching 
understand that not every coaching style is going to be your style, but you can pick up tips and, and, um, skill sets from just about anybody. Um, but put your head down and work. And when you're tired, have the discipline because that's when motivation leaves you have the discipline to get back after it and to continue your work. I think that was the biggest thing that was taught to me when I was at Alliance. I didn't have that discipline. I had a motivation to fight. You know, I was a big, strong, athletic guy. And so I had the motivation to go out there and prove myself. Um, what I learned at, at Jackson's and throughout the rest of my career, I went to Glendale after that. And then I kind of did my own camps after that. Um, was was the discipline and continuing your craft is and that was where you know i would tell myself shut up and get to work never tell yourself that's good enough if you're gonna say if you have that moment where you're like oh well that was good enough well that wasn't done right then because there's a right way and a wrong way and if you say that was good enough that was not the right way to do it 100 percent preach travis preach and you know, a weird thought came to my head if the wwe ever asked you and ronda to do a tag team mixed whatever they call it mixed match would you ever go to the wwe with her you know i think uh given my wife given my wife's uh status with wwe i don't think that'll ever be in the cards but oh, um man. but at the at a time there there that would have happened for sure um, and I think that would have been so much fun. It, it would have been a bucket list thing that not too many people get to enjoy. Um, but, you know, I, I, at this point in my life, I'm really focused and honed in on the ranching and the farming and, and the cattle and the chicken and running that business. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to create an empire, something to leave my kids so that they have something to also work on later on in life if if they so choose, you know? A hundred percent. And, you know, before we go, the floor is yours. I'm very interested. Where can we actually find this? Is there a website? It, 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 do we go to the farm? You know, what's that all like, Travis? Yeah, so we do all direct consumer. We ship nationwide. Um, you can go to browseyacres.com, B-R-O-W-S-E-Y, acres.com. Um, obviously it's a combination of mine and my wife's last name. Cause without my wife, it wouldn't have happened without me. It wouldn't have happened. So that, and then the fans kind of got behind it. Right. And they, and they started pushing that forward, but really it's about doing it right and not just good enough. Right. And that's really like one of our main, like, uh, a main North star, in our company is to do it right and at, at doesn't matter the cost right it's this is what this is what it needs so that's what we're gonna do and then we'll figure out everything else later but yeah browseyacres.com um we ship nationwide direct consumer um we, we ship our american wagyu our full blood wagyu and our pasture raised poultry we'll be coming out with like a full blood uh box club which is America, uh, full blood Wagyu. And then you kind of get into a club where you have access, early access to merch and other drops. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're going to be introducing all other sorts of, of items into the company as well. Um, we're getting into like food trucks and, and doing a, a whole array of, uh, of stuff that, that is like kind of centralized around, what me and my wife really believe in and that's doing it the right way and, and as drake says big tings and i mean honestly i i feel stupid now because i honestly was i was going to ask you where did that name come from and then when you said i was like oh shit, that's exactly where it came from and yeah. you know, first five people to get something from that site link will be in the bio send me a screenshot we'll get you some stuff, special stuff out because in order to be the best as we've learned you got to eat like the best and you know Wagyu sounds pretty damn yummy. So I think Good. that's a win win. And, you know, Travis, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for making, you know, my time better. And thank you for making me look like a jackass with that introduction. I really, I tried on it. I really did. Man, I'm over the, effort, the effort was there and, and it was amazing. I, I, it just needs a little bit of work when you're, when you're, when you're trying to con 
uh, you know, compare yourself to the best to ever do it. Right. Like which, which I get it, which that's what you need to do in order to make yourself something right. Compare yourself to the best. Like I'm, that's, that's my goal is to be better than that person, man. You got, you got a little ways to go, but I love the effort and I love the, uh, you know, the drive. I love it. And yeah, you're right. To be the best, you got to act like the best. And, yep. and that's simply as, as, as it goes. And guys, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on this video. All of Travis's links and his ranch will be in the bio. Check that out. Also, please check out the Reem versus Papa fight, which will also be in this bio because that is the best fight I've ever seen in my life. Until next time, guys, Travis, oh, I'm not going to do it again. Travis Brown and the underdog out.